Well, welcome everyone to this series on an astonishing and amazing message of the wonder of God's grace. And I, I believe that uh, we're going to experience open heaven through this series. We're going to be in, a, in an experience of an atmosphere of undiluted, unfading glory. I believe as the series goes out, people are going to be healed, just sitting in your seats, just listening. Transformation is going to take place. The miracles of God are going to manifest. Mm -hmm. People's lives are going to be edified and transformed, and we're going to enjoy the goodness of our God. So let's just pray together. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Mm -hmm. We thank you that the truths of the kingdom of heaven are available. They're beyond the range of our natural minds, but they're well within the range of the Spirit who searches the deep things of your heart, Father. Treasures of glory and riches that are not hidden from us, but hidden for us in the wealth that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. The unsearchable riches of Christ are unsearchable to our natural minds. But Father, your Spirit searches all the deep things of your treasures and reveals to our hearts the wonders and the delights of this great salvation. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come and glorify Jesus. Lift him and magnify his exalted place at your right hand. Let his high priestly ministry perfume this entire series. May we feel the goodness of our heavenly advocate and he that speaks on our defense in the heavenly realms. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint every heart, every mind in this place and that they may experience the fullness of Christ and the blessings of God in Jesus' name. I believe a really good place to start is the reason why we need to change the way we think. We need to change our thinking. That's what the message of grace does. It is so radical. It changes the way we've been programmed. We've been conditioned by a culture of coercion and religious control, often manipulated into ways of thinking that is nobody's fault. And we're not putting the blame on any person or religious organization. It is the corrupted wisdom that comes from the demonic realm, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was there in the garden. And when Eve looked at it, she, she saw that it was desirable for wisdom, but it was a corrupted wisdom. It was a wisdom that opened the human conscience to a corrupted wisdom. And that that wisdom produced the fruits of people that began to hide from God. They became conscious that they were no longer walking in the created order, in the highest state that God had ordained for them to walk in. They suddenly became conscious that they were naked of the glory. They developed an ambivalence. They began to withdraw and hide from God and, and begin to cower from God. And a false fear of God began. And they put on fig leaves. And they began to create a religion, a shallow religion that manufactures an alternative to walking in the manifest glory of God. And today we see pervasive, sadly and tragically, without judgment or criticism, we see a pervasive shallowness in the religious world of what I call fig leaf religion. It's a religion that has all the manufactured external expressions of worship, but it is a hiding from the glory of God. It it is hiding from the presence of God. It is self-righteousness. It is the wisdom of this corrupted age. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, somewhere around verse 28 to 29, that Christ has been made wisdom to us. That is righteousness, holiness, and sanctification. And the cross was God's secret wisdom, hidden from ages past, before time began, destined for our glory, and had the princes of this world known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. For God ambushed the evil ones at the cross. They did not know the wisdom of God hidden before time began for our glory, so that the glory of God can return back to the church. Now, this first stage has got to be changing the way we think. And that's what we're focusing on this first stage. Because you can, you can say you believe a lot of things, but until your thought process changes, before strongholds or established mindsets, cultural conditioning are demolished in the way we think and brought into the obedience of Christ, the way Christ thinks and the way he thinks about us and the way we should think about God. Until our thought process has changed, none of these benefits 
will be ours in fullness. We will live on the periphery. We'll experience some of the blessings of Jesus. But until our thought process change, we will not be in that transformed place where we can walk in all the fullness of the finished work of the cross. Anyone want to say a woman or a man or a person? All right, fantastic. In Psalm 139, verse 17, David says, How precious are your thoughts of me, O God. And I want to say this, that God has nothing but precious thoughts for those that are in Christ Jesus. There's not one ugly thought. There's not one disapproving thought. There is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There is no accusation. There's no separation from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You're on the fourth front of God's mind. He's always thinking good thoughts. His thoughts of you are perfumed with the fragrance of joy. When he thinks of you, which is all the time, his whole being just lights up with great love and affection and, and desire. Now, there's not a lot of amens right now, but by the time we get halfway through the series or before that, your mind is going to begin to think, whoa, this I've been lied to. Religion has lied to me. The demonic has lied to me. Jesus said that the devil is the father of all lies. And when he speaks, he speaks his native language, which is lying. And so he lies and he deceives. But when we begin to think God's thoughts about us, that they're precious and our lives become perfumed by the grace thoughts of God, we're going to see a change in our whole being. God's, God's song, he's singing over you and me all the time. You were always on my mind. <laughs> all right, sorry, just a bit of Elvis anointing there. <laughs> okay, Rob, how can you be so sure that God has always got good thoughts about me? Good question. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to around about verse 13, that no mind is conceived, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those that love Him. Now, He's not talking about heaven. The context is clear. He's talking about now. And the very next verse goes on, verse 10, and says, But God has revealed these things to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. For no one knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit within the man. And no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And we have not received, Paul writes, the spirit that is of this world. That's the spirit that deceived Adam and Eve to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and took them away from the tree of life. We have not received the spirit that is of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that God has freely given to us. That's the key. They are freely given through grace. They're not earned they are not deserved. They are the thoughts of God revealed by the Spirit of God, the things that God has freely given to us. And verse 13 says, Therefore we speak not with human wisdom, but by the Holy Spirit. We speak discerning spirituals from spirituals to spiritual things to true spiritual things. That's what the Bible's saying there. So there are spiritual things that are we discern the difference between them, that some are false, they are counterfeit. There are pseudo-religiosity, and then there's the authentic integrity of the kingdom that Jesus brought in. And those are the thoughts of God. Everyone still with me? How are we doing? Yeah. When Jesus said to his disciples, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> Many dear believers around the world, their default setting uh, goes something along like this. Oh my God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The end is near. I better repent. I've got to reconfess all my sins. I better tell God how bad I am. I better impress him by my morbid state of mind. And then maybe God won't turn me into polyunsaturated margarine across the ground because God is obviously angry with me and I better repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Friends, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. This word repent, we need to understand how beautiful the word repent is. Let, let me give it to you in the Greek, the Greek that the Bible uses and the Hebrew that the Bible uses. The word repent in Greek is the word metanoia 
And the Hebrew word for, for repent is tashuva. Now, metanoia, the Greek Bible word means, repent means change the way you think. Yeah. Metamorphosis, metanoia, change the way you think. Tashuva, the Hebrew word for repent means return to grace. Tashuv in the Hebrew means return. Ha means grace. Mm -hmm. So the word repent, the biblical, if you say, we must have more repentance in the church. I say, yes, amen, amen. <laughs> amen. The church needs lots of repentance. I repent every single day. We have to change the way we think and return to grace. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's tangible. It's touchable. It's come. It's around us now. Effortless miracles are now accessible effortlessly. Come on now. Come on. Jesus is saying, this is your message, guys. The, the old covenant is about to end. It's, it's, it's now coming close to the climaxing finale of the old covenant. The new covenant is coming soon. It's not far away. The kingdom has arrived with me, Jesus is saying, and it is now at hand. Every old order is going to pass away. There is now a new and a living way. Repent. Think differently. Return to grace. Return to the highest state that first Adam lost. Last Adam is now on the earth. Where sin abounded in first Adam, grace in last Adam is going to hoopa parisia, the Greek is. It's going to superabound to a greater level. Don't think anymore about old covenant ways, legalistic performance, man's effort-based religion anymore. Change the way you think. Return to grace. The kingdom's touchable. It's at hand. It's accessible. It's not far away. Miracles can happen effortlessly. You can hear the voice of God now much more clearly. You can be secure. Change the way you think. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 16 verse 15, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I'd love to develop that a lot more. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I don't have time to touch on that, but there's so much stuff I want to get into. But this is the foundation. The way we think has to change. We have to think through a whole new set of lenses. Think through a whole new paradigm. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The old order is gone. The new covenant has come. Let me say this, that our thoughts shape our beliefs and our beliefs shape our convictions and our convictions shape our attitudes and our attitudes shape our perceptions, and our perceptions shape our behavior. So behavior change starts with a sequence that starts with thoughts that shape beliefs, that shape convictions, that shape attitudes, that shape perceptions, that then shape behavior. Now, religion focuses only on the surface of things. Law-based religion, which is sadly... Per, prolific in the earth today, law-based religion shapes at the surface of things. It looks at the behavior of people and wants to modify that behavior, wants to change that behavior. And so religion will often resort to behavior modification techniques. It will use mainly techniques based on robbing you of your dignity and then selling it back to you at the price of your conformity to a religious system that is fueled by guilt manipulation, control, making you feel threatened that if I don't change, there is punishment coming, there is anger coming, there is disapproval coming. Now, friends, behavior change on the outside is very impressive to religious systems. It is not to God. If you know anything about the Bible, God does not look on the outside. He looks on the heart. Yes. Many times we can be doing things externally that we think, God, you must be impressed with this. My God, can you see my behavior? Can you see what I'm achieving? Friends, the kingdom's not achieved. It's received yeah. freely. There is no self-righteous, self-effort, human self-sufficiency. 
The delusions of human self-sufficiency is being shaken all over the world. Right now, people couldn't even predict an economic crunch. The, the experts and the skilled can't see. Everything is shaking except the kingdom of God, which is an unshakable kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so we can impress people with the external things that we achieve through the sweat of our brow, through our fig leaf religion. We can impress gullible people. We can look so holy and we can be doing so many great religious things but in the middle of all that unfortunately God spoils it and asks us one question Rob people are applauding you people are praising you whoa they they believe you're doing well man thinks you're doing great you are doing some amazing things Rob just one question <laughs> when God asks a question it's not because he suddenly lost his omniscience status <laughs> When God said to Adam, where are you, Adam? It was not a geographical question. It was a cardiographical question. He wanted Adam to locate himself. God loves to ask you questions. <laughs> In the middle of doing great things, God says, just one thing, Rob, all very impressive. One thing, Rob, why are you doing it? God's not concerned about what we're doing. He's concerned why we're doing. What is the motivation behind what we're doing? What, what is the... 1 Corinthians 3 says, the day's coming when there's going to be a fire test. And it's not to determine whether you go to heaven or not. It's to determine what you receive in heaven, your rewards. And it's going to be based on the issue of why do you do things? See, why do I want to be holy? Is it because of law-based religion that is focused on behavior, but doesn't start with changing the way we think and the whole process. Have I still got you? Yeah. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so, so law-based externalism, behavior-based manipulation of religion is a full and complete failure because it focuses on the surface of things and it doesn't change the way people think. I believe the day's coming when on this planet there are going to be people called sons of God that walk in such a way. The word Christian is only mentioned twice in the entire Bible. And yet when all people talk about the church world today, they just talk about Christianity. But it's only mentioned twice in the Bible. But the word that identifies us as believers most and used dozens of times in the Bible is sons of God. And women are sons of God. Galatians 3 says, there's neither male nor female, but all are one in Christ. The Bible says that creation is groaning and crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. Yeah. Creation is not groaning for the manifestation of Christians. It's seen enough of Christians and it's wanting to see sons of God. Amen. Yeah. Adam, first Adam, was a son of God. Where he walked, the glory was. There were no earthquakes. There were no famines. The earth was beautiful. It lived in a, under a canopy of glory. It was watered from within its subterranean depths. There was no disease, nothing wrong with the DNA or the genetics of mankind. There was no sickness, no disease, no broken relationships, no wars. There was no tsunamis. There was no earthquakes. God wasn't doing those things. Because his creation, his cosmos, was perfect. And son of God, Adam, walked with God. And he was made in the image and likeness of God. Likeness means same appearance. So I just want to stop there for a while. Adam was made. God said, let us make man in our image. The other verses say, in our likeness and image. Likeness means same appearance. Image means same quality. Now let me quickly say this. That Adam was never God, never will become God. You and I will never be God. That would be blasphemy to say so. We will be, we are sons of God. God the Father alone is the immutable, self-sufficient, self-existent, uncreated, almighty God. He is God. But we are sons of God, made in his image and likeness. When Adam walked the earth in the cool of the evening, with God in the glory, in a perfect cosmos. The angels were stunned. The angels looked perplexed from Adam to God as they walked together and they tried to work out who was God and who was Adam. 
because one was made in the image, the appearance and the likeness of God, the son of God walking with his father, God. The Bible says in the new covenant that the entire purpose of the new covenant or the main objective is to conform us to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is in the glory by spirit of liberty, not by spirit of condemnation. 2 Corinthians 3 says, by a spirit of liberty, liberation, freedom in the unfading glory, we're all being changed from one degree of glory into the image and the likeness of Jesus. The day is coming when the church will come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. And we will no longer be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But the believers will be known as the sons of God. And where they walk, they will walk like twins of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, those who believe in me, the works that I do, shall they do also. And even greater works. Our goal is not Christianity. Our goal is to be twins of Jesus. To be conformed to the image of the firstborn. And walk as a son of God. So that creation no longer has to groan out in frustration. So earthquakes and the pain of created order, suffering shall be changed for where the sons of God walk. Creation will no more groan, but mountains will sing worship to God and trees will clap their hands together and praise God. And the galaxies and the stellar systems declare the glory of God. We are not sitting at a rapture bus stop wanting to escape from this horrible world. We are here to say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> we were born at the climax and the consummation of the ages when all of history has been summed up in Jesus. We were reserved as the 11th hour workers to be on the planet now. We are not trying to get out we're not trying to have better church meetings. We want to see sons influence politics, education, the arts world, economics, the way things are done, society change. Can you say amen? amen. Sons of God. When Jesus, the son of God, walked, creation stopped groaning wherever he went. When storms came up and threatened to kill people, he didn't look at the storm and say, my father gave this and my father wants to judge you. And he's sending tsunamis and earthquakes to kill everybody because father hates and is mad with all of you. No, he said, repent, change your way of thinking, return to grace. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm a son of God. Storm, peace, be still, be silent, storm. And the waves... Nature subjected itself to the Son of God. The sons can suspend and subject natural law to the higher law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Religion is boring, cruel, horrible, harsh, nasty, but popular. Because it offers fatalistic explanations to life's suffering, simplistic answers that we can kiss our brains goodbye and we don't have to think. It's the sovereign God doing that. We don't know why he's doing it. He's just doing it. Friends, that is religion. Religion deals with the surface of things. It gives simplistic answers to simple issues. Ocean goers on the northern ocean lanes often remark about their amazement at these huge icebergs that are moving steadily and strongly against the powerful prevailing winds. And yet they move into the face of the prevailing winds and move against the prevailing winds into the prevailing winds. And the answer is, of course, seven-eighths of these icebergs bulk is, is submerged below the surface of things and strong, powerful underwater currents carry them against the prevailing winds. The secret of the sons of God is that the bulk of their being, the, their souls, their consciousness is not at a surface level of religion, but deeply submerged in the currents of grace and in the divine thoughts that God has for us through the new covenant. And they're full of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And they are carried by divine currents that press them steadily and effortlessly against the prevailing popular winds of secular humanism and the corrupted wisdom of religion. 
religion and they stand against the opposing winds of, re- of religion and the cunning craftiness of men that lie in wake with their deceptions and their trickery of every wind of doctrine that tries to toss us back and forth but we are submerged into the glory thoughts of God we are carried by the currents of the eternal truths of almighty God revealed in the new covenant and so you can see the people of God who are in the new covenant and are, their thoughts have been changed they have changed the way they think they've returned to grace they're living in a whole new way of thinking because you see they are courage you can see these men and women down through the ages the popular winds of opposition blow against them society sometimes turns against them but they continue even rejected and disapproved of they continue because something is carrying them below the surface of things and they are supernatural signs and wonders and they are standing up in our age and in our time and their model is inspiring multitudes to stand up and say we're in to being sons of God as well through persecution through difficulty we are carried because something deeper than just surface things is carrying us away with fig leaf religion let's be covered with the glory of God (laughs) I've been a pastor for 32 years and uh, the first two years, 10 years was, was an amazing journey because I couldn't work out why people who said that they were full of the creator of the heavens and the earth, that they were full of this creative God, and they were, they were living this magnificent life. But then I looked at Christians and I just thought, what is this? See, I, 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 um, I grew up in an atheist home, in an agnostics home, and uh, they forced me to go to Sunday school on Sunday morning because that's the morning they had this physical intimacy and as kids we didn't know so that we, they just pushed us out and we went and, and I went to a lovely little church and but I, I didn't um, I wasn't impressed with churchianity and then I, I, I became an atheist which is ridiculous because there's no such thing as atheist you see when I saw Christians as a 12 year old and 13 year old 14 year old I, I, I wasn't impressed I have to be honest and I got into the surfing crowd, and I got into the, you know, the party crowd, and a little bit of the drug world, not too seriously, but I got into that. And I eventually, I eventually began to say, but where's meaning and purpose in life? Eternity inside my heart was crying out. We, we don't need to come to God because our life's miserable, or we've gone bankrupt, or we're in a state of divorce, or something bad's happened to us. That shouldn't be the reason we come to God. The reason we should come to God is we were created to walk in the glory. We were created to have reference with an infinite reference point. We were created to know God as sons of God. And so I began to seek God, but I couldn't see it in the church because the church seemed boring to me. And so I started studying transcendental meditation. Then I studied uh, 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 Islam. I read uh, the Quran. I, 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 then I became a Hindu eventually. I became a Hare Krishna, studied Srimvad Bhagavatam, Upanishads, the Vedic scriptures. Was even celibate within marriage. I was so committed. Because we were not allowed to have sex within marriage. Unless we chanted for two hours on our mantra beads. And so we'd be so transcendent we wouldn't even know what we were doing. And merely for the purpose of procreation. And so... Somewhere in all the middle of that, God came into my little Hare Krishna cell and, and literally appeared and manifested to me, spoke to me audibly, called me, just, just arrested me. I mean, in that Hindu temple, I became a new creation in Christ 34 years ago. I've been in full-time ministry 32, so I planted a church after being saved two years. Glenda myself. And after 10 years, I looked at church life and I said, God, what is wrong? Why aren't Christians, why aren't we more colorful? Why, why aren't people attracted to the texture of sanity in our lives? I, I mean, I'm not talking about being dishonest to the world and pretending we don't suffer and have problems and difficulties. I'm not talking about fakery because we go through similar things the world goes through. But how we handle these things. How come there's so much grumpiness in Christians? How come there's so much self-pity? How, much, how come there's so much self-centeredness and jealousy and envy and gossip, which are all the fruit of being under the law, Galatians 5. The fruit, fruit of the flesh. Flesh refers to self-effort. The law, 
wants self-effort from us. Mm. How come? And so I wrote this poem. I hope I can remember it. But I wrote it 20 years ago as a question. There's so much color inside you and me. I wonder why we keep it in. Isn't this gray world dying for a lack of it, like a deprived desert, cracking in pain? Why do we cringe in the corridors of conformity like timid little souls? What will people think of us are the shackles that bind us as we carry our weighted chains with earnest but fading strength along the dismal pathways we tread? Freedom! Beckons like a lover, but like slaves to pretense. We say, no, we're doing fine. Tradition keeps us towing the line. Then I see the carpenter dancing on the water. Mm. Then I see the carpenter turning (laughs) water into wine. Mm. Colors flashing in his presence. Chains breaking in his presence. There's so much color inside you and me. I wonder why we keep it in. I tell you what, it's because we've made the law the control factor. That we're not aware that we're no longer under the law. We're in a new covenant, a covenant of grace. So let me say this. The issue of grace <laughs> the issue of grace. All right, let me put it this way. There is no controversy in the, in the church world today on the definitions of grace. Almost all of us Christians would be in perfect harmony and agree almost 100% with the definitions of grace. You know, grace is God's unmerited favor. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God accepting us and just loving us. Grace is God's empowerment. Grace is God giving us, you know, special advantages and favor in life. Most people would agree with that. The problem comes, not on the definitions. The problems come when anyone claims that God relates exclusively, uniquely, continually and only through grace to those that are in Christ. That's when all the the, the warning lights come up. Whoa, be careful. Be careful now. Now, friends, I'm amazed at that because the New Testament, read the whole New Testament, only has one warning about those who secretly sneak in unnoticed to change the grace of God into a license for immorality. The rest of the new covenant is red flags continually warning of the curse of the law, of being yoked again to a slavery of bondage to the law, that the law will bring a curse of poverty, sickness, and disease on you. The law will stir up sin in your life, and the law will not strengthen you against sin. The Bible says the law will strengthen sin, and the power of sin is the law, 1 Corinthians 15, 56. So the law can be preached mixed in with grace. Red flags don't come up. In fact, people are applauded. But as soon as you say, God's going to relate to you in the new covenant only through grace all the time, every split second. So the question is, well, Rob, what if my behavior, yeah, we come for this behavior. Remember, behavior is at the end of the whole sequence that starts with the way you think. What if my behavior is not very good? What if my behavior is not good? It's it's a little bit bad sometimes. Will that change the way God relates to me? No. He still is going to relate to you totally through grace. But if you want to be under law, then the way God relates to us, then it does change. Under law, the way God relates to you will always change according to your behavior. The beggarly elements of this world that Paul speaks about is this basic principle in all world religion. Do good, get good. Do bad, get Get bad. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the new covenant, God relates to you through grace all the time. And he sees you as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus 24-7. Every split second, you have a standing before the Father that is co-equal with Jesus. And as Jesus is before the Father, so are you before Christ 
all the time before the Father, even when your behavior fluctuates up and down, your righteousness is not based on your fickle behavior. It is based on the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, last Adam. That's the thing, Romans 5.19. Through the, through the disobedience of the one man, the many were condemned. Through the obedience of the one man, the many are declared righteous. So you've got a foolproof righteousness, failure-proof righteousness, devil-proof righteousness, because it's not based. You see, how many of you want to obey God all the time? I do. I want to obey God 100% all the time. Romans 1.5 speaks about the obedience of faith. You see, see, it doesn't say the obedience of the law. It's the obedience of faith. So when you believe this gospel and your thinking changes, more and more obedient actions will precipitate on the behavior end of this sequence. But the issue is not preaching a gospel of a changed life. The gospel is not a message of right living. It is a message of right believing. Amen. And it's right believing that begins the process and produces the transformed behavior with the right motives. Because now your thinking is no longer, if I don't do this, God is going to smack me. If I do that, he's going to crush me. No, no, no. It's a pure motive through a whole new way, a perfumed whole new way so that our motives to be holy, our motives to obey are from a pure heart. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? So if at any point you think in your thinking, which will affect your believing in your attitudes, your convictions, your perceptions and your behavior, if at any point you think, yeah, God loves me and he's operating by grace to me, only when I'm really behaving good, or if I'm sort of not so good, he'll still be sort of nice. But if I'm not so good for quite a bit of time, he suddenly changes and now he's relating to me through my behavior. That little chink is the loophole the enemy will exploit and interrupt and make the whole process dysfunctional. So let me bring this to close within the next five minutes. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, here's a letter written to one of the most rascal churches that I think has ever existed. Let me not say right. A, a, a church full of very carnal people. You know, sometimes you hear this today, and I've said this myself in silly moments. Oh, God. If only we could be like the early church. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we have this idealistic dream that they were super saints, that somehow they had a special dispensation. Uh, I don't know what we, why we think that. And I think God would say, you want to be like the early church? Okay, which one do you want to be like? You want to be like the Ephesus church that lost their first love and fell from a great heart? Or do you want to be like the Galatian church that started in grace, went back under law, and when they were under law for too long, they started having sexual orgies. Immorality, because that's what the law will produce. <laughs> they started gossiping and slander and had envy, party and factions. Do you want to be like the Galatians? We're foolish. They got bewitched. They went back under law when they'd seen grace. <laughs> Do you want to be like the book of Acts, where the people squabbling and fighting over groceries? Do you want to be like the Corinthians? <laughs> the Corinthians were getting drunk at the communion. They were seeing who could outdo each other in the volume and length of the way they would speak in tongues. They would parade their spirituality. The Corinthians were, they were denominational. They were, they were um, institutional. They, they, they had their favorites. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. They were carnal. They didn't, they should have said we're of Jesus. The Corinthian church had members in their congregation going in having sex with temple prostitutes. The Corinthian church had a man sleeping with his mother-in-law, and he was born again. Scripture, 1 Corinthians 5, it's very clear. He was born again. Incidentally, when they went and had sex with temple prostitutes, and they were in Christ, these people, uh, and Paul planted this church. <laughs> See, today, if there was a church behaving like these guys, every apostle that had been involved would have disowned them and said, I never knew them. <laughs> 
Paul writes to them and says, you're my credentials. <laughs> you're my credentials of my apostleship. I thank God for you. I have all these affections for you. That's a part apostolic grace. Wow. And, and he says, when these guys are having sex with these temple prostitutes, he didn't say, that's it. You lost your salvation right there. The first act of intimacy with a temple prostitute, that's it. Christ left you. Now he said, you're making Christ one with Balaam. He didn't tell them, thou shalt not commit adultery, you fornicators. He didn't put the law on them. What he read to them and said, don't you know you are righteous? Don't you know you're in Christ? Don't you know you are light? He, he, he built them up by giving them their identity. I, I believe today that in parenting children in grace, the whole issue is, don't we have to give them the Ten Commandments so they'll know the difference between right and wrong? No, I don't think we should give them the Ten Commandments. I think what we should give them is their identity in grace. I think we should tell them that in Christ, we love to share. In Christ, we love to forgive others. In Christ, we love to tell the truth. See, think about this. Joseph, remember, Joseph lived how many years before the law? The law hadn't even arrived. There were still hundreds of years to come before the law arrived, when Joseph, son of Jacob, was alive. Joseph went and was betrayed by his brothers. He was treated unbelievably, ends up as a slave in Potiphar's house. Potiphar has got a sexy wife. She, her perfume you could smell through the whole palace. And, and she dressed like seductively. She had a spirit of Jezebel on her. And she flaunted her wares daily for weeks trying to wear Joseph down. Joseph was red-blooded. He had no law. He didn't know the Ten Commandments. They were still coming hundreds of years away. And he resisted her. And he never gave in to her. And he won the victory. And later was promoted to the most powerful man in Egypt. So everyone had to bow down to him, including Potiphar's wife. And if you had to ask Joseph, Joseph, how did you win the temptation over Potiphar's wife? Did you obey the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery? He would have looked at you like, what are you talking about? He didn't have the commandments. They hadn't arrived. Sinai was still over 100 years away. He would say, no, I didn't give in to that. I felt like it. Whoa, I felt, whoa, whoa, I felt like it. But I didn't give in to that because I know Jacob, my dad, he really loved me. I know my identity before my heavenly father is favor. See, law will make people externally holy when people are watching. But will you walk in holiness? under law when no one's watching. Mm -hmm. But grace changes the heart. <laughs> so there was a man in 1 Corinthians 5 in the Corinthian church that was having sex with his mother-in-law. We don't know the details. All we know is it must have been so open and so perverted and flaunted among so many people that Paul says even the unsaved Corinthians are shocked. Now the Corinthian city, was they were the champion sinners. And the champion pagan heathen sinners were shocked at the immoral behavior going on with this man, with his mother-in-law. So which church would we like to be like? Which New Testament church? <laughs> and Paul writes to these guys, and he writes in 2 Corinthians 3, the most remarkable revelation on the distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And he teaches them the truths of the New Covenant and he doesn't put the law on them and tell them to stop it. He gives them more revelation of who they are in Christ. Now, I've had men come to me and tell me that they're addicted to pornography over the, the internet or website or whatever. And, 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 and because when you preach grace, men and women feel the security to come out in the open and be transparent. When you preach law, no one will come and talk openly about their struggles and their temptations. And, and sin will just go under the surface and get more dangerous and more, and, and more perverted. Yeah. But when you preach grace, you create an atmosphere of safety in the church where it's okay to be weak. It's okay to have failures and it's okay to be struggling with certain sins. And you don't feel you're stripped of dignity or dishonored or gossiped about when you actually admit. Because you see, it's in our honesty and in our weakness that the power of God is perfected. Amen. And so instead of whipping these people, Paul comes and he says, they obviously don't know their true identity in Christ. So let me give them the revelation. So let me read it quickly to you and then close. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's read from verse 7. 
Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? That's the gift of righteousness. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. For if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lost? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Look at verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Many people say, I wonder what the letter is. Maybe it's just... You know, what, I wonder what the letter is. Well, the next verse tells us what the letter that kills the churches. He said it's the ministry of death engraved on tablets of stone. What is that? The, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not to bless you. The Ten Commandments is not a moral guideline. The Ten Commandments is not to make you righteous. The Ten Commandments is to curse you, to crush you, and to condemn you. It is to strip you of all self-righteousness and in your state of humiliation to cry out for the gift of righteousness and turn to the one who is grace. Amen? Because there's not a message of grace and grace is not a doctrine. Grace is a person. He is Jesus. So we see that to preach the law is to cause the glory to fade on the church. It kills the church. That's why the church keeps needing revivals. The new covenant is ever increasing glory. And if we stay in the new covenant, we'll never need a revival. Re the need of revivals is a sign of how much law has been preached. And then people go and fast and pray. And then they think all their fasting and pray produced the revival. No, it didn't. Somewhere in that, someone got faith in the new covenant. And then began to preach the wonder of the, and then the glory came, unfading glory, and somewhere there they go back to law, ministry of death, engraved on stones, performance pressure, and God's people to live up to standards always brings death. It speaks of two glories here. We've actually been changed from one degree of glory, we've changed from one glory to the next glory. There's only two glories, actually, to be strictly exegetically true on this passage. Paul isn't really talking about increments of glory. I know there are greater and greater glory that we can access into. But the passage, strictly exegeted truly, is only talking about two glories. A fading glory of the old covenant under the ministry of death and an unfading glory of the new covenant when we believe in the gift of righteousness mm -hmm. that we have no more condemnation. So here's the definition of the two glories. The, the, the glory of the old covenant is God's view and opinion of you through the law. So when he looks at you through the law, the law scrutinizes you with perfect moral exactitudes. And even if you're thinking of committing adultery in your heart, you, uh, uh, you are guilty of the act and you're worthy of death. To hate someone without cause, you are guilty of murder. And so in every area of the law, the spirituality of the law, when God looks at you through those lenses of the law, all he sees is wrath, judgment, sin, so his glory has to fade. Every time Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. God said, no, I can't. You've got to harden the rock because the Lord come and I'll show you my hind parts, my afterglow. God walking away from it. Under the old covenant, God's glory is always walking away from you. It's always fading from you because God sees you through the lenses of the law. New covenant, God's view and opinion of you only through the lenses of grace 24-7. Every split second, he sees you 
as the righteousness of God in Christ Amen. Jesus, not based on your performance, but based on the performance of Jesus on your behalf, not based on your obedience, but based on the infallible, perfect obedience of last Adam, Jesus on your behalf. So when you believe that message, there's a spirit of liberty, there's a spirit of freedom, there's an unfading glory, Amen. and in that glory, your thoughts change, your beliefs change, <laughs> and you End result is behavior. So the angels look at you, look at Jesus, say, Who's, they're twins. They're walking like sons of God. That's where we're heading. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the revelation that is flowing freely and unhindered in the earth today. We thank you, Lord, that there's illumination that is coming more and more, that there's a revolution of grace flooding the globe, that sons and daughters are being set free into their full inheritance in Jesus Christ. And Father, we want to thank you that the anointing on this message will go and, and flow unhindered and unrestricted and release liberty and favor and joy and supernaturally transform the way we think. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you.